it's actually not difficult. Uh, you've got to realize that I was lucky enough to spend my summers in wild places in the Adirondacks of upstate New York, and I fell in love with nature. I decided to become a scientist, and by virtue of that, uh, I might have chosen wildlife biology or ecology or fisheries or botany or ornithology for that matter, but I fell in love with rocks and mountains and structures and became a geologist. And so I was a natural born environmentalist from a very early age, and I never saw there was a dichotomy. Going to work in the energy business was a way for me to practice my science. The only difference between me and a professor in the geology department, or geosciences, here at Colorado State University is that when he came up with a new idea, he applied to the National Science Foundation for a grant to test his theories. I went out and raised money in the private sector. The consequences of his research might be earth-shattering, but it weren't, weren't necessarily economically determined. Mine were. And so if I had a great idea, I would have to go out and raise the money and drill a well, which is a way of testing Mother Nature to see whether or not my ideas of what's going on under the earth are correct. And sometimes they were and sometimes they weren't. All the time I was practicing as an oil and gas geologist, if you had gone out in the field with me when I was managing a drilling operation, say in western Wyoming, you would have discovered that in my day pack, you'll see this in the book, right, I carried a Sibley's bird book, I carried an Audubon wildflower book, and I carried the book on Rocky Mountain trees. And every chance I got, I would be off fishing or hiking or going up to ranches and asking permission to go on their lands. So it never ever occurred to me that I was doing something that was harmful to the environment. Everybody I ever worked with, we were always cognizant of the fact that we were stewards of the land, even while we were drilling wells whether you are running a ski area on Bureau of Land Management or if U.S. Forest Service land or whether you're a rancher with grazing rights or you're drilling, you have to be, you're obligated to take care of the land that you've leased, in this case, from, from the government. So I never saw it as, as some kind of a conflict until the environmental movement made it an issue and labeled people like me the enemies of the environment. It irritated me to no end. And so when I retired from oil and gas, after having created a very large amount of brand new wealth that nobody suspected existed, I went right into conservation practices. And I was able to marshal my science into a new career, conservation ecology, wildlife biology. One science is not all that different than another science. And also, I was able to utilize some of the wealth that I had just created to try to do good works but not to sue people, not to harm their livelihoods, but to actually find practices that were sustainable economically for them while they were also a positive benefit for wildlife. Right. And um, from that, um, the other term that you might have coined, might not, I'm not sure, I've never heard of it before, but um, radical conservationist, um, that is another word that you say you know, defines you, it's on the cover of your book, how does that connect with all of it? How did you become one of those? The early environmental movement, as I just pointed out, demonized people. They sued people. They demanded new laws from the government that would punish people for bad behavior. The thing that attracted me to Leopold was that he wanted to incentivize people to do good things for good behavior. You got paid for it instead of being punished, losing your property rights. Uh, uh, coming under onerous government regulations, it was a much more collaborative thing. And so I started looking for radically new approaches that people had not tried. As an example, uh, if you're a cattle rancher in Colorado or in Wyoming, uh, your job is not raising cattle, your job is raising grass. I like to lecture to people and explain that ranchers are actually grassland ecologists. If they destroy the grass, their cattle have nothing to eat. The only thing they have to sell is beef. Nobody wants to eat grass. Well, almost nobody. And so, and so they actually have to be better stewards of grassland than their fathers and their grandfathers before them in order to make a sustainable li livelihood. And so if they're grassland ecologists and people in the cities decide that 
the sagebrush and the grasslands are more important for sage grouse. It's a particular bird that I worked on for a long time. Why not pay them to raise sage grouse? If we think that it's more important to have sage grouse on the land than cattle, and maybe they can live together, but if they can't, why not pay these people? Do you really believe that a giant government agency is gonna manage the land better than somebody who's the fourth and fifth generation living on the land? Why not make it economically viable for them to live with sage grouse and prairie dogs and antelope and elk? Uh, they're already doing most of that themselves without any help. So why not give them a little bit of help and make their livelihood sustainable? All right. And um, I mean, one phrase that I took from the introduction of book was uh, California Bambi environmentalists. Like, though you are not one of those. I can be really rude at times. <laughs> I grew up in the suburbs of New York City, and I sometimes have to apologize for my language and my posturing. I grew up in a pretty rude environment compared to the Midwest. I love Colorado. I really want to be a Westerner, but there's a little bit of New Yorker that you can't take out of the boy. He grew up with it, and I like to confront issues head on. So what I mean by a Bambi environmentalist is someone who thinks animals are cute and cuddly and should be taken care of, that people should be punished. So they hate the oil companies, but what do they, what do they drive to those meetings in? An SUV. What do they use? Electricity from coal-fired plants, come on. You know, even if they buy a Tesla, what do you think the electricity comes from? It's oil and it's coal and it's hydro and it's wind and it's solar and it's natural gas and it's a combination of stuff. They have a carbon footprint too. So just be honest about it and be forthright. Part of my lectures, uh, I, I like to talk to my audience and a question I ask them is, what's the most dangerous wild animal? So don't say human beings, wild animal in North America. And the answer is Bambi. It's the white-tailed deer. It kills more people in auto accidents. It carries wasting and Lyme's disease. Lyme's disease is a catastrophe. You get sick on Lyme's and don't get, get cured. You are sick for a long, long time. It eats more crops, and it's destroying the seedlings of our eastern, midwestern forests that nobody seems to know about this. So not managing Bambi by getting rid of and culling a lot of those animals actually is harmful for biodiversity. So don't go around saying, I love Bambi. Bambi actually is not a good thing. We don't have the resources to manage Bambi if we do away with things like hunting. So there are lots of people that hate hunting. I'm not a hunter. I do not hunt. But hunting is a management tool that our game and fish people need to have in order to balance wildlife. It's just not nature anymore. There are seven billion people on Earth. What do you think? We're gonna get rid of six billion of them and go back to some idyllic life living in a teepee? I don't think anybody living in a fancy house in California driving an SUV really wants to live in a teepee. It's, pretty, it's a pretty harsh life. You know, talk to the Shoshone. <laughs> and how did you take that? Um, so, I mean, okay, I'm gonna start over again. Um, so, you know, you went to Zimbabwe to, um, uh, you know, this is the entire, you know, what this book is about. And um, in the introduction, you write that few, if any, laymen like me have been invited to do what amounts to some of the most dangerous volunteer field work around. So you went from, you know, your conservation work here um, in the American Midwest and you found yourself in Africa um, somehow doing this. And um, what drew you to Africa and what prepared you for this experience? Well, first off, what prepared me was an entire lifetime of being able to live in the bush. I'm a field geologist, but from the time I was a kid, I could go off and, and, and wildcraft and live off of plants and sleep on the ground and love it. Not in the middle of a you know, Wyoming blizzard necessarily, uh, but I had a lot of, of bushcraft, and so that made life a little easier. The fact of the matter was, I went to Africa as a tourist. It was the trip of a lifetime. I was gonna go and walk in the bush with, with sand bushmen and other tribal people who were now safari guides, and I, was, I didn't wanna drive around. I didn't wanna be in big buses. I actually wanted to walk on the land and see the animals from the perspective of local people. What happened was, I flew all the way over there with my wife, Jackie. We got off the plane, and I literally 
transformed. In Mound, Botswana, I looked at the sky, I smelled the, the Botswana sage smelling in the air, I saw the local people for the Tswanas for the first time, and just bloody fell in love. So I make a joke out of it, and I explain to people that we evolved on the savannas of Africa, our ancestors and us, for the last three million years. So we have an Africa gene, and I grew up I was born in Brooklyn and grew up on Long Island, New York, and so my Africa gene was switched off. And when I stepped off that plane and saw Africa for the first time, it switched on. If anybody that sees this can remember what it was like the first time they fell in love as a teenager, that's what happened to me. It was not a scientific or logical experience, it was an emotional experience. I wanted to go back to Africa and work in conservation because I'd fallen in love with Africa. I did not realize that I had so much to learn from Africans about conservation until I got there and started working. And uh, why rhinos in particular? You know, there's elephants, gorillas, you know, you name it out there who could use conservation. Before we went to Africa, it's the scientist in me, what did I do? I read the history of Africa, about 1,200 pages, and then I got books on animal behavior, and then I got books on tracking. I actually had spore you know, charts with me so I could tell the difference between a kudu and an impala, two kinds of antelope. And I did a lot of research in advance because personally, I get a lot more out of an experience if I know stuff going in, instead of just having a guide who explains the entire world to you, which is a good thing, but I put more effort into it. And one of the things I discovered was that among the tourist things that are not very smart to do is tracking black rhinos in the thornbush country on foot. Even in vehicles, they're dangerous. They, they smash vehicles. Uh, elephants are dangerous too, and elephants are even worse because they'll take a vehicle and turn it upside down as many times as they like. They're even stronger. But rhinos, black rhinos in particular, are like uh, insane animals. They react very violently when they get scared, and you never know what they're going to do. And you literally have to be able to climb a tree or else you're going to get squashed by them. Running around a tree is not a good thing. They can run really fast. And so, sure enough, I find a guy and I talk him into taking me tracking black rhinos, my first experience in Africa. And that was it, I got hooked. I, I am a, uh, I'm not an adrenaline junkie, I am an adventure junkie. And I, and, and I explain that, Julia, because I don't get adrenaline rushes. I've been charged by elephants and rhinos, I've been faced off by Cape Buffalo, and nothing happens to be emotionally. I stay really, really calm, which is probably why I'm still alive. I don't get scared, but I also remain calm. And so I found that I have this ability to actually be out there in very dangerous situations and not panic. And so I went off to Africa the next year with a wildlife biologist from Colorado State University. Carl Hess Jr. got his PhD here at natural, uh, the Natural Resource Ecology Lab, NREL, in my college. Uh, and so we made this connection, I went off to Africa, and by accident, I ran into the people who take care of the rhinos. So I said, can I volunteer? And they said no. <laughs> and that irritated the living heck out of me. I don't take no very easily. But I understood that it's very dangerous work and they don't want an amateur. They don't want to have to look after somebody when they're running like maniacs, they're carrying dangerous drugs, they're carrying chainsaws and helicopters are flying and fixed wings are flying and, and scouts are on the ground and everybody's talking on radios. It is an insane ballet, but it is a ballet that everybody has to understand their part and have to do it all in this concerted action or else somebody could get hurt or a rhino could die and they don't want that to happen. And so I understood my rejection, I just didn't like it. So I came up with a little plan, which was as I started working in Africa, I made friends in Harare and I started throwing big parties. Because the way to a scientist's heart is through bombers of beer. I'm a scientist. They like to go to parties, they work really hard. So I didn't just invite the rhino guys, that would have, they would have figured it out, they'd have been smart. No, I've invited the embassy people I met and the USAID people I met and uh, World Health Organization and other scientists, World Wildlife Fund, this and that, and through these big parties. And it took 18 months before they invited me to volunteer. That's persistence for you. <laughs> I am persistent. Good. Um, and 
So what are your thoughts on um, what you term gangster governments in your book and the politics of poaching, maybe a bit of background on, on the dehorning and, um, and such for those who don't know. Um, actually, how are we doing on time? Um, my watch is dead, actually. Hmm? Uh, 2.52. Okay. Oh, great. So there are a lot of Westerners who think that the problems of Africa are the consequences of colonial government, and there are some negative, there are some positive consequences of, col of the colonial period, but there are also some negative ones, obviously. Other people think that it's, to be blunt about it, that these Africans are just not smart as we are, and, and they need to be helped. We, we, we have to be missionaries and tell them how to live, and we have to be uh, uh, good social workers and scientists, and we have to tell them how to do things right, and that's bogus. These people have been living in this countryside for hundreds if not thousands of years in harmony with nature, doing their own thing. We did mess them up with national governments. And one of the consequences of national governments from tribal people and how the colonial powers divided up the territory, they very cleverly, the Portuguese, the British, the Belgians, they all very cleverly looked at a piece of an area of their colonial empire and they thought, okay, these two or three tribes hate each other. We'll put them all in the same political thing and they'll we'll be able to rule them because they want to kill each other. And so we are the ones who are going to stand in between it. It ruined the Middle East, it ruined Africa, and it has these long-term consequences. And then there was the Cold War. The enemies of our enemies were our friends. So we gave guns to horrible dictators and the Russians and the North Koreans and the Chinese gave guns to other people who called themselves communists, but they really weren't. If you look at their polit politics, they really weren't. They were autocrats. They were people who thought they would be chiefs over bigger areas, like national areas. And that created this tendency towards gangster governments. We, grow, we grew up in a culture, at least I did, and I think, I don't want to speak for you, but we grew up in a culture where we learned that through hard work we could create wealth and we could keep some of it. We could actually become rich or at least comfortable, right? And some of our work would raise the standards of living of other people. We're all in this together, you know, maybe we become really rich but we find new resources or we create new products that people really want and we help their lives out as well and that's how the American system has, has worked for a long time. What we don't understand is people like Robert Mugabe and Zanu PF, the gangsters of Zimbabwe, believe that the way to wealth is to steal it. They don't understand wealth creation. They steal it. And they will steal it from rich people and they will steal it from poor people. They really don't discriminate that much. So when Robert Mugabe almost lost an election in 2000, instead of deciding that it's okay for the country to be a democracy and the rising middle class to vote against him. He got angry and he clobbered his own people. He killed and burned the villages of the Shauna people. He didn't even go after the opposition so much because his own people had voted against him for the first time. And the gangsters took control. And they raped that country of the billions and billions and billions of dollars. Zimbabwe was a budding democracy and the fourth largest exporter of agricultural uh, uh, produce in the world. And today it can't feed itself. The commercial farms have been destroyed. The industries have been raped and destroyed. They found diamonds, what do you think? The army moved in and they took over the diamond mines and it kept the gangsters going. And if Africa doesn't figure out how to govern itself, we're never gonna give them the answer. They have to figure it out for themselves and it's gonna take a long time. They're gonna to have to stand up and say, this is not how we wanna live anymore. We don't wanna live under these guys. And it's up to them to do it. And in that environment, what do you see as the future for conservation efforts in Africa? It's a very mixed bag. As an example of what's happened, uh, the white farmers who considered themselves Rhodesian Zimbabweans, they didn't see themselves as white outsiders. They were generational people who loved this country and they were sending their kids to the same private schools with black kids. I mean, they, this, this was not apartheid like South Africa. Rhodesia actually was a much more integrated society. Uh, and, and there was a rising middle class of business people, 
the first people, when Robert Mugabe kicked the whites off the, the, the farms, the first people to go in the streets were the farm workers. They had lost their jobs. They were well paid for Africa. They were highly paid agriculturalists. And they didn't want their, their bosses and the people they worked with to be kicked out of the country. They knew what was coming. And then there were four million people of the middle class and they ended up leaving the country and washing toilets in South Africa. He kicked his own people out. He ruined the country himself. And so, so the Africans have to figure out how to manage themselves. But we're clearly not gonna fly the, uh, you know, the, the special services in and take over the country and give it back to them. That's not gonna work for them because gangsters are gonna take over again and again. They have to find a way to govern themselves. And I didn't answer the question, did I? So it's a mixed bag. So they invited the Chinese in because the Chinese helped to, fu to fund and to, uh, to arm their revolution. And without really embarrassing people, if you think American businessmen are bad for the environment, you haven't seen what the Chinese do. They rape and pillage the land. They even took over farms and they wanted to bring in Chinese farm workers. They wouldn't even hire blacks. They think blacks are inferior. There's a lot of racism going on, and it's not just whites who are racist. Blacks can be racist, Asians can be racist. It's a poison. It hurts me so much. I love people. I, I, I want people to live together, and yet there is so much tension in these places. So what's gonna happen? We don't know the future. Right now, we're trying to hang on to the rhinos so that the populations are not reduced further. And to me, the answer is twofold. One is, if we make the animals more valuable alive than dead, the local people make a living off of them somehow, like photo safari business, things like that, we have a chance of the local people taking care of the animals, because that's where the real conservation needs to be done. Not from New York or London, but from the countryside of South African, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, and places like that. And then uh, I believe that the real answer has to come in re-educating the next generations of Asians. Remember that the West believed, right out of the Bible, that nature was something that was given to man, that we had dominion over, and we could do anything we darn well pleased with it. And we're just discovering that that's not working really well for us anymore. We better take care of nature or it might not take care of us. Asians have not learned that yet. 90 million sharks are killed every year for shark fin soup, which is a tasteless thing. I ate it 40 years ago. And the Chinese government can say, oh, we're not doing that at banquets anymore, but they are not really supporting conservation. So the answer is to educate the next generations of Chinese and Vietnamese and Indians and other Asians into a different view of nature, something that we want to live peacefully with, we want to live in harmony with, instead of just using it. So you spend some time here at campus um, educating the next generation, as you say. Um, you uh, make regular appearances to speak to students, and each summer you lead a four-day uh, field trip as part of the geosciences curriculum. Uh, what do you like about that, and how is that experience for you now, after all that you've seen and done? Well, as much as I work in conservation, I still love geology. It's a puzzle that I love to actually think about. I also love being in the field with students. Because being in a classroom and giving a talk, I won't claim that I teach, but I give lectures or talks, is a totally different dynamic than going out in the field with young Turks, men and women, who can hike you into the ground. And I am a tough old bugger. I, I hike Boy Scouts every summer into the ground, but our geology students have been working in the field and by God, they are gonna see if Ed has the moxie to keep up with them. And I get to sit around a campfire. I get to hear about their lives and their ambitions, right? And their, their beliefs and, and the wonderment that they still have. The, the thing for an old guy like me is to be around young people. It's inspiring. It re and I got all, my wife laughs when I say re-energized. I got a lot of energy, but it does. It, it's a spiritual thing as much as anything, and I like to sleep on the ground. <laughs> you don't understand that, do you? But I do. I used to joke that I slept on a slab of granite better than I slept in my own bed. I'm a little weird. 
<laughs> so, you, so you got a lot of energy. Uh, you graduated from CSU in 1968. What are some of your uh, memories of your time here? I was a very lucky kid. Uh, my parents really believed in education. They wanted me to get an education. I was not ready to go to college. I was, a, I was only 17 when I graduated from high school, and I was a mess. And I was lucky enough to come out to Colorado to a very small geology department. There were nine professors and about 60 undergraduates and graduates. We all hung out together. Faculty, staff, and students all hung out together. And I found a home for myself away from that rat race of New York City in a beautiful outdoor environment on a gorgeous campus where I had mentors who actually cared about me. And they thumped me. Uh, my professors did not let me get away with anything. They understood that I had some potential and the only way I was ever going to actually tap into that potential was to get off of the little chip I had on my shoulder that I could, you know, I, I could get away with almost anything because I was smarter than everybody else. Well, it wasn't true, number one. And it was really an excuse for not working hard. I learned my work ethic here at CSU, and it's carried me the rest of my life. I also had wonderful professors who gave me a great love of academia. So as screwy as academia is compared to business, it's a very different environment. Uh, I have a great love of CSU in particular, but, and academia in general. It brings something very, very special to the American culture, and land-grant universities especially are, are a, an endowment to the future that you know, Abraham Lincoln gave us all those years ago that is still in force. It's still something to really believe in. So how do you think that universities are doing these days with preparing their you know, young science students for um, you know, the future in, as, a, as scientists and natural resource managers? There's room for improvement. There always is. Uh, the, the public schools have actually declined in academic excellence. That creates a problem for universities. There's a lot of remedial things that need to be done. Uh, one of my great great sadnesses is that in the sciences, sciences like geology and chemistry and, and physics, we attract very few minority kids. They come to college, but they see how hard science is and they don't realize how rewarding it is. They don't realize that it's like one of the greatest careers you can have. You can actually make a living out of it. That's a good thing. But it's also a really great adventure, and yet we're not attracting them. And it's hard for them because they're not given the skills that they need to get in high school. I went to a high school on Long Island. I had two years of calculus in high school. I had four years of science. This was a, this was a very, it was a public school in a middle class blue collar town that had high quality education. And I'm afraid that's gone downhill. And it's hard for universities to remedy that. It makes it harder for them. There's, other, there's one other thing that we're moving up to Fort Collins and I am gonna hopefully have a more active role. But I think there's a lack of philosophical background taught to science students. Science students never get a class in the history of science. What is science all about? Where did it come from? I think that's really important. There's a little piece of philosopher in me. I think students should have to study the philosophy of science, not just the methodology, the scientific method. That is not enough. This, if, you, if you understand the long history and traditions, then you think about how non-authoritarian science is. All of a sudden you realize that the pet theories that your science teachers are teaching you are just their pet theories, that you can think for yourself. We need to teach more thinking for yourself. quick. Um, the hot button issue, fracking, you were a pioneer of that, um, of the, your oil fields in uh, Wyoming. Um, can you just, you know, it's, it's been a topic of, uh, of serious debate lately, and uh, what's your take on that? It's a very interesting phenomenon where uh, there are advocacy groups who find, as you call them, hot buttons, uh, and basically 
uh, create a hysteria in a poorly educated population. Fracking in almost all instances, especially when it's done like in the Nyerbrer right out here east of town, where it's relatively deep, below 6,000 feet, groundwater is never affected. We have really, really good rules in Colorado and Wyoming and places where I work to protect groundwater. And so, as an example, in my great gas field in Wyoming, uh, the state required us to set 950 feet of steel pipe to protect groundwater. Where we were, the groundwater was poisonous. Remember the old emigrant trail where the people drank from springs and died from arsenic water and soda water? That's what we had. There was nothing potable about it. We didn't set 950 feet of casing, we set 2,500 feet. Why? Because on top of any contamination of water, there were the pressures involved and you don't want to burn a rig down and kill people. So we were very conscientious. We also were very environmentally friendly so that all of our facilities were painted the exact color of the earth. So that if people drove by looking for prairie dogs or coyotes, they could hardly see what we were doing because it blended into the countryside. So we, my, my partners were pioneer Wyoming families. They loved that country. So fracking is incredibly safe. When you see somebody turning on a faucet and there's water and gas burning, I've got to tell you that in a lot of aquifers, especially where people are tapping into coal-bearing layers, people have been finding gas in their water for the last hundred years. It's a natural phenomenon. If you were to frack a very shallow accumulation that was right next to an aquifer, you could mess it up. And so you don't want to do that. So we, need, we just need a sensible approach to things. There's also one other issue, and this is something that the average person doesn't understand. A mineral right is a senior right to a surface property right. That's our old English common law. It means that the guy on the surface cannot keep the guy who owns all the property values underneath it off of the property. We have 150 years of history like that, and England has 300 years. And yet, people ignore it as if it doesn't exist. Oh, we don't have to care about law and convention and cultural history and property rights. We're just going to tell people what they can do and can't do. And I think that creates this demonization by environmentalists of people who actually are creating wealth for everybody else. Who here does not use natural gas? In Colorado, we heat our homes with it. Uh, a lot of our electricity is now generated with it. It's a val valuable resource. Huge tax base. State of Wyoming, because of my gas discoveries, Pinedale and Jonah, uh, went from almost needing a new state income tax to having a trust fund in billions and billions of dollars for the future of the state, primarily for education. They spent their money, they didn't spend it, they invested their money very wisely in Wyoming. And so there's a state that thinks that this is a good deal and has shown that it can be done environmentally safely and be a great benefit to society. I guess the operative word is can, though, right? Not every company is as careful as yours. You know what? Not every one of your neighbors keeps his lawn mowed and keeps his backyard clean. Some of them dump an RV in the yard, you know, and it becomes an eyesore. That's human nature. But we have the best environmental laws in the world. We don't need to worry if the Chinese come and buy a forest com company, they cannot rape the land like they can in Africa. When I, I was talking to an environmentalist recently from Boulder, Socialist Republic of Boulder, they're wonderful. And, uh, and, and we were talking about various environmental issues and she brought up, how come I don't drive a Tesla, right? And I said, because they have a lot of battery issues and batteries are really bad things. Uh, I've seen videos of poor Indians who are salvaging lead batteries. It's like the nastiest thing imaginable that human beings do this. And lithium mining is not very environmentally correct. So where would be the best place to have a lithium mine? In Boulder, Colorado. Right in Boulder. Don't be NIMBYs. Because the people where they're mining in Africa are being poisoned because there are no environmental laws. But in Boulder, Colorado, there are great environmental laws. You could actually have successful, environmentally conscious extraction of resources in the U.S. and protect the environment, because we're willing to do that. Instead, 
we're being NIMBYs and we're turning our backs on what's actually going on. And I travel around the rest of the world and I see this stuff. And I think that we are actually turning the entire issue on its head when we play ostrich with its head in the sand. And what advice would you give to young CSU students who, you know, are entering this world of, you know, complications and, and you know, things that, you know, like, that require out of the box thinking? Um, um, what kind of advice would you give them? I think the, the most straightforward advice and the most potentially life-changing uh, is the advice I gave when I gave my last commencement address, which is if you're going to take time off between your bachelor's and a job or your bachelor's and a master's or a PhD and a postdoc, I don't care when it is, go and get a job in the third world. And don't tell me it's hard to get a job. Go get an internship. Don't tell me it's hard to get an internship, volunteer. Go and join the Peace Corps. Go and volunteer with some charitable organization and go to Africa, go to Central America, go to Asia where people are poor. Out of the seven billion people on earth, six billion of them are poor in a way that you can't imagine. It'll transform your life. You will see how r real people in subsistence and marginalized existences have to live in life and you will come to the conclusion that the greatest decision of your life was your choice of parents. <laughs> How do you like that? How do you like them apples? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just, isn't that a warped way of thinking? How smart you were to choose your parents as Americans, right? And not poor Shangans living in a village on the low veld where three out of five years their corn crops fail. We're bloody lucky people, and we ought to be aware of that. We shouldn't feel entitled. We should be aware of how lucky we are and use that knowledge to do better things with our lives. All right, so where are we at? I got a laugh out of him. Uh, 3.15. <laughs> All right, 3.15 on the dot. I got a laugh out of the videographer. <laughs> <Cut>. <laughs>